Well, church, this is it. This is the last Sunday after Epiphany. It's Transfiguration Sunday, and that means that next Sunday will be the first Sunday of Lent. We will start a new series then, but today we finish up with my never-ending pre preaching to the choir. Today we finish up thinking about practicing our faith in other ways, because I still am talking about what we do. Practicing our faith here in this church, the people church, not the building church. Today I greet you with this line from 1 John. This is the message we have heard from him and declare to you. God is light. In him there is no darkness at all. Listen now to this call to worship. When the world is full of confusion, we still can see Jesus. His presence shines, a light to illuminate the shadows. His light shows us a way to practice our faith. We want his light to shine in and through us. Amen. Shine Jesus Shine is our first hymn this morning. You know how we felt when the sun didn't shine for nearly two weeks here. And then when it did, we know how wonderful it is to see the shining light of Christ. Let's sing this song together.
Let us pray. Holy God, upon the mountain you revealed our Messiah, who by his death and resurrection would fulfill both the law and the prophets. By his transfiguration, enlighten our path that we may dare to suffer with him in the service of humanity and so share in the everlasting glory of him who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God forever. Amen. Our Old Testament reading this morning comes from the book of 2 Kings, chapter 2, verses 1 through 12. And today, our reading is going to be a children's faith movie. One day, as the prophet Elijah and his follower Elisha were traveling to Gilgal, Elijah received a message from the Lord. Elijah said to Elisha, The Lord is sending me to Bethel, but you should wait here for me. But Elisha said, As surely as the Lord lives and as you live, I will not leave you. So they went to Bethel together. A group of prophets who lived in Bethel greeted Elijah and Elisha when they arrived. They asked Elisha, do you know that the Lord is going to take your master from you today? Elisha replied, Yes, I know, so be quiet. Then even though they had just arrived in Bethel, Elijah said to Elisha, The Lord is sending me to Jericho, but you should wait here for me. Elisha replied, As surely as the Lord lives and as you live, I will not leave you. So off they went to Jericho. A group of prophets who lived in Jericho greeted Elijah and Elisha when they arrived. They asked Elisha, Do you know that the Lord is going to take your master from you today? Yes, I know, so be quiet. Then, even though they had just arrived in Jericho, Elijah said to Elisha, The Lord is sending me to the river Jordan, but you should wait here for me. Elisha replied, as surely as the Lord lives and as you live, I will not leave you. So the two of them set off for the river Jordan. Fifty of the prophets went and stood at a distance facing the place where Elijah and Elisha had stopped at the river Jordan. Elijah took his cloak, rolled it up, and struck the water with it. The water divided to the right and to the left and the two of them crossed over on dry ground. When they had crossed, Elijah said to Elisha, Tell me, what can I do for you before I am taken from you? Elisha replied, Let me inherit a double portion of your spirit. You have asked a difficult thing, Elijah said. Yet, if you see me when I am taken from you, it will be yours. Otherwise, it will not. Elijah and Elisha continued walking along the bank of the river Jordan when, all of a sudden, a chariot and horses engulfed in a ball of flame appeared and separated the two of them, taking Elijah with it and leaving Elisha behind. Elijah went up to heaven in a whirlwind. Elisha saw this and cried out, My father, my father, the chariots and horsemen of Israel and Elisha saw him no more. Then he took hold of his garment and tore it in two. And now today's epistle, Paul's second letter to the Corinthians, chapter 4, verses 3 through 6. If there is anything hidden about our message, it is hidden only to someone who is lost. The God who rules this world has blinded the minds of unbelievers. They cannot see the light, which is the good news about our glorious Christ, who shows what God is like. We're not preaching about ourselves. Our message is that Jesus Christ is Lord. He also sent us to be your servants. The scriptures say, God commanded light to shine in the dark. Now God is shining in our hearts to let you know that his glory is seen in Jesus Christ. A Gospel reading from Mark, chapter 9, verses 2 through 9. 
After six days, Jesus took Peter, James, and John with him and led them up a high mountain where they were all alone. There he was transfigured before them. His clothes became dazzling white, whiter than anyone in the world could bleach them. And there appeared before them Elijah and Moses, who were talking with Jesus. Peter said to Jesus, Rabbi, it is good for us to be here. Let us put up three shelters, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. He did not know what to say. They were so frightened. Then a cloud appeared and covered them, and a voice came from the cloud. This is my son, whom I love. Listen to him. Suddenly, when they looked around, they no longer saw anyone with them except Jesus. As they were coming down the mountain, Jesus gave them orders not to tell anyone what they had seen until the Son of Man had risen from the dead. Our second hymn this morning is A Wondrous Sight, O Vision Fair. This song tells the story of the Transfiguration. O wondrous sight, O vision fair, of glory that the church shall share which christ upon the mountain shows where brighter than the sun he glows from age to age the tale declares how with the three disciples there where moses and elijah meet the lord holds converse high and sweet the law and prophets there have place to chosen witnesses of grace the father's voice from out the cloud proclaims his only son aloud with shining face and bright array Christ deigns to manifest that day. What glory shall be theirs above, who joy in God with perfect love? And faithful hearts are raised on high, by this great vision's mystery, for which in joyful strains we raise the voice of prayer, the hymn of praise. Good morning. Mark's gospel for today fits the whole practicing our faith in other ways idea that I've been exploring with you for several weeks. We've talked about singing, witnessing, giving, and what we do here in a group when we practice, like how we think about membership, sacraments, learning, that kind of thing. It occurred to me that I've not really talked about the opposite so much, and maybe I should. Maybe I should talk about other ways to practice our faith and not doing it here with the group. I wasn't even sure how one would go about that. I know it's not the same as worshiping with Pastor Green on the golf course, or it's not the same as becoming a fisherman, as in Sunday morning on the lake. It's not the same as observing the Sabbath by resting in front of the TV all day. 
According to the dictionary, faith is a strong belief in God or in the doctrines and practices of a religion. At least that's what we've been thinking as we've been talking about practicing our faith. So what then would be the other ways? I googled it, of course. No sense spending tons of time making things up. Others have already thought this through. There's a whole movement called Practicing Our Faith, which evolved from a book edited by Dorothy Bass. I've not read the book. I also saw a blog that's titled Six Ways to Practice Your Faith While Managing a Busy Schedule. I thought, I need that. I have a busy schedule. It was written for college kids who are so busy. In my head, I am thinking, wait until you get finished with college and have a full-time job and a family and kids and a dog and share in a carpool. That's a bit like busy. Anyway, in scanning that article, it's mostly about being sure to pray, have a prayer journal, pray before meals, join a prayer group. Uh, hey, I think that's cheating. That's practicing your faith with a group of faithful people, a lot like church. Ministry Matters, which is a website I often use, had an article called Four Keys to Practicing Your Faith. And author Shane Rayner put it all into a sports analogy. Remember when I talked about being a football player without a team, without opponents? Well, Rayner says the same thing. You need a team. So it's not in other ways at all. It's about being together in a group, practicing your faith in a group, holding each other's up as a group. I guess I didn't learn much about the other ways. Anywho, today our lectionary leads us to see the light. I hope throughout this time that I've been preaching to the choir, your way is well lit for showing the benefits of being solidly in a group. Because gosh, I love my groups. But today, it's about light. Today is Transfiguration Sunday. It's the Sunday before Lent begins. It's the Sunday when we remember Jesus on the mountain and then think of him becoming illuminated in blazing light and then Elijah and Moses joining him, also blazing white as well. And after all that light, it's only Jesus, standing there in his usual wattage, leaving the three disciples Jesus took with him, wondering what just happened. Then there's light in the Old Testament reading, Elijah and Elisha, and the final off in a blaze of glory, literally, for Elijah, leaving Elisha behind. And Paul talks about light, about the gospel being veiled, somewhat light subdued, and that we need someone to proclaim Jesus Christ as Lord for us. Then we will have the light of knowledge, a light shining out of the darkness, because we will have the light of the gospel. I sometimes just love the lectionary designers. Sometimes it's so crystal clear for a theme, and sometimes it's as clear as mud. Today is a crystal day. But the final thing I want to say about practicing our faith as I preach to you, my choir, <laughs> is this line from today's gospel. I think it shines light on all that's important as we walk as a church in the ways of Christ. God said, as I read in the CEV, this is my son and I love him. Listen to what he says. Other versions of the Bible say it very similarly. This is my son whom I love. Listen to him. This is my dearly loved son. Listen to him. The Amplified Bible, which we've been hearing from more and more as we do our Simon Peter book study, says it this way. This is my beloved son. Listen to him and obey him. That does amplify things a bit. Listen, but also obey. So I go back to my preaching, oh, you poor choir. I'm going to say you hear more and more about what Jesus says when you are in a group like this. You can read about it in the Bible, but not all of us are diligent about reading faithfully on our own. And when you find a troubling passage, like we did recently in the Simon Peter study, whatever is bound on earth, Peter, you will bind in heaven, and whatever is loosed on earth, you will loose in heaven. Who do you discuss that with? And when you love a passage, who do you share it with? And when you're alone and something you read says to turn to Hosea or Habakkuk, I can't even say it, do you do it? Do you even know where to find those books in the Bible? I maintain that the people in a group called church will hear more of what Jesus says and will carry more of it away with them because they are in a group where it's all talked about. It's our job, church, to build each other up, and we do that best when we are with each other. So it's about practicing our faith in the light of a group, not the light of knowledge that Paul talked about, but in the light of the gospel where God can shine forth and where we can perhaps hear words inspired by God and hear Jesus' words. Remember, God said, 
This is my son, and I love him. Listen to him. Having this message being our last choir message seems fitting. After the transfiguration of Christ, we are on to Lent. It starts Ash Wednesday, this Wednesday, and during Lent, it is a time for us to transform ourselves through times of repentance and prayer, so we are ready to shout, Hallelujah, Christ is risen on Easter Sunday. How does looking into the bright light of the word and Christ's transfigured face help us do that? Well, that's what we will be up to for the next 40 days. Looking through the darkness for the light that is Jesus. We talked about witnessing before. I think the people of a church can be the lingering glow of God's light, pushing the transformation of heaven's light into the darker corners of life. When we see darkness, we can share the light of the gospel. There is an ancient legend first told by Christians living in the catacombs under the streets of Rome. It tells about the day when Jesus went back to heaven after finishing all of his work on earth. The angel Gabriel meets him there and welcomes him home. Lord, he says, who have you left behind to carry on your work? Jesus tells him about the disciples, the little band of fishermen and farmers and housewives. I bet there were some choir members in there as well, I'm just saying. But Lord, said Gabriel, what if they fail you? What if they lose heart or drop out? What if things get too rough for them and they let you down? Well, says Jesus, then all I've done will come to nothing. But don't you have a backup plan, Gabriel asks? Isn't there something else to keep it going to finish your work? No, Jesus said, there's no backup plan. The church is it. There's nothing else. Nothing else, says Gabriel, but what if they fail? And the early Christians knew Jesus' answer. They won't fail, Gabriel, he said. They won't fail. Isn't that a marvelous thing? Here are the Christians of Rome dug into the earth like gophers, tunneling out of sight because of the terrors of Nero up above. They're poor and despised and insignificant, yet they know the promise of Jesus. You won't fail. You're my church, and you won't fail. We are on the doorstep of another Lenten season. It's our job to prepare ourselves. According to Ask UMC, Lent is a time of repentance, preparation for the coming of Easter, a time of self-examination and reflection. In the early church, Lent began as a period of fasting and preparation for baptism by new converts and then became a time of penance for all Christians. Today, Christians focus on relationship with God, growing as disciples and extending ourselves, maybe choosing to give up something, but maybe it is better if we give of ourselves instead. We have today to think and pray. Practice your faith in your busy life by praying. Perhaps take a Lenten booklet you or, so you have something to read and help shed light on this time of the Christian year. Take a list. I'll send it out in an email if you let me know you need it for the Lenten offering that will be collected someplace on Easter Sunday. It will be used to be light to someone or other. And ask yourself this week and for the next 44 days, how am I glowing today? Practice your faith by showing the light of God in your life and as you live your life among others, that will help people in their decision to join a choir. Let us pray. Lord God, Jesus, light of the world, illuminate the way for us this Lenten season. Help us to practice our faith in the days of Lent in such a way as to bring glory to you, Heavenly Father. We are God's disciples in the world. Give us Holy Spirit power as we move forward, practicing our faith. This we pray in Christ's name. Amen. Let us pray. God, you come and do not keep silent, no matter the strength of the wind or the intensity of the fire. You illuminate our shadows and bring clarity to our confusion. You speak, you shine, and in your voice we hear mercy. In your presence we see grace. May your presence, your work, and the word inspired by you move in our minds and hearts, our bodies and spirits to transfigure and transform the world. But Lord, if there is need, and there is need, Transfigure and transform us as well. Make us be a light for others. Help us to share your light with the world. There is light in our world, Lord, because of the many blessings you share with us. Thank you for this body of Christ, for this building in which we gather, and for the many who do things to make our worship both joyful and joy-filled. We also thank you for joys in our lives. Darkness comes into the joys of life in times of sickness and death. Dark comes in with worry and pain. There is dark and loneliness and grief. 
We pray now for those from our church who are walking through the dark valleys and the dark shadows. Holy and living one, for those we have named and the ones whose names we do not know, hear our prayers. In the dark times of our lives, Lord, remind us to practice our faith by prayer. Help us feel peace and hope when we pray. Listen now, Lord, as we pray the prayer you taught your first disciples. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Our final hymn is for February. It's Heart Month and also the beginning of Lent and also Black History Month. This last song has more to do with reminding us how we are to treat people of all colors with hearts of love like Christ has taught us. We need a faith. And now this benediction, people of God, God has shined life into you. You have seen it. Now go and let your lives also shine. Amen. Sing one more time. Shine, Jesus, shine. Shine, Jesus.